And we live in a society that is very interested in doing or in finding what is, maybe not always actually, but what is perceived to be justice. We live in a an increasingly litigious society in which the it seems like the solution for more and more of the problems that ail us is we need to just sue somebody. Something goes wrong, well, what are we going to do? We're going to get a lawyer. And in many cases, the goal is to see how big of a check we can get out of it. But we live in a society where that seems to be more and more the reality. You turn the news on, and it's not uncommon to see as one of the headlines, who is suing who, what person is suing some major company because of some actual or in some cases maybe perceived wrong. It's even something that's become something of a joke for some in our society about how we'll sue over sometimes absolutely frivolous things. But when that happens, we're looking for judgment to be in the right direction. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, it says it's appointed for men to die once, then judgment. In our text that was just read for us in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, we have a particular word that's used there, that Jesus Christ is our advocate. It's something of a, that can be looked at as something of a legal term. That Jesus is one who pleads our case. Jesus is one who comes alongside to plead for us on our behalf before the Father. So we're going to be looking at the gospel from the standpoint of something of a courtroom scene this morning. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. If we have one that's pleading our case, as we look through Scripture, what we find is we have one who's trying to plead against us. Turn with me, if you will, to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse 9, we learn something about our enemy. That he's not only trying to tempt us, he's not only trying to get us to give in to sin, to pull us away from God, but whenever we do something that's wrong and we all sin, he's there to accuse us as well. The great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night, they overcame Him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. We have an accuser. When we think about, you know, when we give in to sin, it says there that He is there day and night accusing us before God. But, you know, as we think about the prosecution, as we think about a courtroom scene, many times the one who is prosecuting, the defense is there trying to, to say, oh, no, that didn't actually happen, happen. But in this case, as I think about the one who's accusing me, he's right. I did sin. I've done the things that are wrong, that are against God's Word. Told that lie, coveted something, lusted, treated someone poorly because of selfishness. I'm guilty. All are. And we have an accuser who's trying to destroy, who it says, before God, day and night is accusing you really going to claim that as your child? You see what he did there? You see what she said? Accusing to try to get us out of fellowship with God. To try to get us to be counted guilty before the Father. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He tempts us into sin and then accuses us, accuses us of that very sin before the Father to try to get us into trouble, to try to get us to get the fellowship broken with God. And the fact is, as we've already seen, as is 
uh, stated in Scripture in Romans chapter 3, all are guilty of sin. This comes through clearly, especially in the book of Romans, but in other places in Scripture as well. In Romans 3 and verse 9, Paul is making the case throughout this chapter, throughout the chapters that preceded as well, that all are in sin. Sin is a universal problem. He talks about the sins that the Gentiles are in. He talks about the sins of the Jews. And he says here in chapter 3 and verse 9, What then? Are we any better than they? Not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. And he quotes from numerous Old Testament passages in what follows to show that everyone is in sin. This is a universal problem. Verse 20, By the works of law no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes only the knowledge of sin. We've sinned and we can't get out of it ourselves. I've sinned, I've earned what chapter 6 tells me is the death penalty, and my own behavior can't get me out of it. I can't do enough good things to make up for it. Verse 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The sentence we've earned is death. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God in Christ Jesus our Lord is eternal life. We've earned death and it's been that way from the very beginning. As God told man in the garden, don't eat from the tree in the middle of the garden. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for in the day you eat, you will surely die. Our breaking of God's will, our going against His commands brings the death penalty. We have one who's trying to accuse us. One who's accusing us of doing the things that, well, we've done. Romans 6 and verse 1 says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Paul says, may it never be, but the truth is sometimes we do sin. Sometimes we mess up. John writes there, as was just read for us, my little children, I'm writing these things to you that, so that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You see, we have one who's accusing. We have one who's trying to get us counted guilty. But we have one who is there to plead our case as well. There's the other side of this case that we have Jesus Christ as our advocate. The Greek word there is one who pleads the case of another before a judge. It's a term that can be used legally. And just as the accuser knows, the, our advocate also knows that we're guilty. As a matter of fact, he only pleads for the guilty. He only takes the case of those who are guilty. He only defends the guilty. But what do we plea? You know, after all, you think about in a court case, you always get asked, what do you plea? You can plead guilty, you can plead not guilty, you can plead no contest. There's a number of things that you can plea. But what do we plea before this court? Because obviously when we think about human courts, if you plead guilty, obviously you're counted guilty. The only way to potentially be counted not guilty is to plead not guilty. But in the court of God, what do we plead? Well, a plea, of, a plea of not guilty would prevent him from coming to our aid. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, we see that. If we plead not guilty, Jesus won't take our case. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So how do we plead? Guilty. Because you see, a, a plea of not guilty or innocence would lead to being found guilty for sure. The only thing to do is to throw ourselves at the mercy of a completely righteous judge and His Son who defends us. Now that takes a lot of humility. You know, as we read before in Mark chapter 2, verses 14 to 17, whenever Matthew, or uh, as he's referred to in Mark's gospel as Levi, was called, Jesus was invited to this reception at, at Matthew's house, and 
when the Pharisees saw this, when the Jews saw this, they got really upset. What's Jesus doing eating with these sinners and these tax collectors? What's He doing with these people? And Jesus said, it's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Now, Jesus is not proclaiming that the Pharisees here are righteous. But they just didn't recognize their sin. They saw themselves as righteous. And if we see ourselves as righteous, if we see ourselves as having got uh, righteous living all figured out and we've got everything right, well, we're really not in a position where we can be helped. We have to be humble enough to admit our need, in this case, to admit that we're sick with sin. We have to be humble enough to recognize that we are guilty. But you know, when you think about an advocate, one who pleads our case before a judge, you have to call on them. You know, after all, if you're accused of a crime, you have to ask for a lawyer to plead your case. You know, I remember growing up and seeing ads on TV all the time. If you've got legal trouble, here's the number to call. But you're not going to get representation unless you make the call. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not suggesting we make any of those phone calls. Those usually weren't the ones you would want representing you anyway. But the point is, you had to call. But Jesus, if He's our advocate, we have an advocate with the Father, how do we call on Him? Let's go to Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, and we have Paul telling about his conversion, telling about what happened to him on the road to Damascus. I apologize, we're talking about a call here and I got a notification here that popped up somebody was trying to call me and it covered my notes up. It's not the call we're looking for. Acts twenty two sixteen. 16. I apologize for that. Um, so Ananias comes to him there in Damascus and says to him, why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on His name. How do we get this, this Jesus to be our advocate to plead for us? We have to call out to Him. We have to appeal to Him. We have to go to Him. And we appeal to Him through responding to the gospel. We appeal to Him when we obey Him. We appeal to Him when we're united with His death, burial, and resurrection in baptism. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, Peter speaks of this. He says, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We appeal to Him in the form of obedience. We call out to Him when we obey Him. We're cleansed. And He becomes our advocate when we inquire, when we appeal. But we have to appeal. We have to inquire of Him. We have to call out to Him. And He comes to our aid because He knows what it's like to be tempted. In Matthew chapter 4, we read about Jesus in the wilderness being tempted. He's been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights and Satan comes to him and says, if you're the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. It's a temptation for something that Jesus really wanted. He hasn't eaten it over a month. Matthew says there he was hungry. We have something of an understatement. If you haven't eaten in over a month, hungry might not even begin to fully describe how you would feel. And that's when Satan comes to him, tempting him to misuse his power. With a temptation that was real, a temptation for something that he wanted. He understands what it's like. The Hebrew writer says he was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. He knows what it's like. He's able to come to our aid. He's able to plead our case because he knows what it's like to face the difficulties and the hardships. And so we have Jesus pleading our case. We have the enemy who is fighting against us, who is accusing us. We have Jesus who is our advocate who is there to plead for us, but we finally come down to we have to have a verdict. 
in our text in 1 John. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and He Himself is the propitiation for our sins. Not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. He is the propitiation for our sins. That's a word that means that He is the satisfaction. He is the payment of. God has wrath at sin, and Jesus satisfied that wrath inasmuch as He has paid the penalty already. The way that we can be guilty, that our accuser can know that we're guilty, that our advocate can know that we're guilty, that the judge can know that we're guilty, and we can plead guilty and still be let off is because the fine has already been paid. Jesus Christ has already taken care of the debt. And on that basis, our advocate can go before the Father and say, forgive Him. It doesn't count. When we trust in Him to have done this, that faith makes it so that we are credited as righteous. Romans chapter 6 and verse 7 says that he who has died is freed from sin. And he's talking there about the death that happens when we're united with Jesus in the waters of baptism. Our old self dies and we are raised as a new creation. We are raised to a new life. We are raised as a new creature in Jesus Christ, free from sin. When we die, we are freed from sin. And we continue to have freedom from sin as we walk in obedience. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7 says that if we walk in the light, as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin, continues to cleanse. That word cleanses is a form in the Greek that means a continued action. That as we walk in the light, as imperfect as we are, that as we try to live for Christ, as we live in obedience to the best of our ability, He continues to cleanse us when we mess up. And because that penalty has already been paid, because we have the blood of Jesus that covers, that continues to cover, when we slip up, the sin doesn't even make it to the record book. 2 Corinthians Chapter 5 and verse 19 says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them. The accuser comes and says, well, this is your child. Look at this ugly word, he said. Look at this greed that she demonstrated. Look at that lust. Look at the selfishness. And when the judge looks at the record of one who is walking in the light, of one who is imperfect but striving to live for Jesus, there is no sin on the record. What sin? It's not because it hasn't been committed, but it's because the blood of Jesus has removed it. The blood of Jesus has taken it away and continues to take it away as long as we live by faith. What sin, the judge might ask, as he looks at our record because it never made it to the book. We have an accuser. We have an advocate. And we have a desired verdict that has eternal consequence. And it all comes down to the question of, what's your plea? We pretend that we're innocent. First John chapter 1 says that we're a liar and the truth isn't in us. If we confess, He's faithful and righteous. He is trustworthy and just and right to forgive on the basis of Jesus but we have to humbly come to Him for forgiveness. And the irony of the situation is that this is the only court where if you plead not guilty, 100% of the time you're counted guilty. But if you plead guilty, you throw yourself obediently at the mercy of a righteous judge, you're counted not guilty. Although everyone knows the sin was committed. You see, I know that I'm guilty. We all know if we're being honest, we know that we are. 
but the good news is that we can be acquitted through Jesus Christ who's paid the price for us. The good news is that our sin doesn't count in Christ. Let's conclude our lesson this morning with a word of prayer. Our holy and righteous and perfect Father, we come before You in recognition that You are holy and You are, you are the God of all creation. You are the Creator, Father. You are, uh, you are light and there is no darkness in You, Father, but we recognize that we are a sinful people. Father, we come before You and confess that we, we have committed things that are against You. And Father, it's easy to generically say that we've sinned, Father, but it's sometimes difficult to say things specifically that we've said and done things that cost Jesus His life, that we've said things that hurt others, that we've participated in gossip and been greedy. Father, we've looked with lust, we've been selfish and impatient. And Father, we've been inconsiderate at times to others. And we've, Father, we are guilty of that, and I'm guilty of that. And I pray, Father, that You cleanse us of that guilt as we humble ourselves before You, Father. And I pray that we would be a people who humble ourselves before you, as your word says, that when we, that we confess that you are absolutely trustworthy, that you are faithful to forgive, and we thank you for that. We thank you for the price that Jesus paid. And we thank you, Father, that we can stand before you holy and blameless and beyond reproach, not because of our goodness, but because of the goodness of Jesus. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. We have the opportunity to have the best defense, stand before a righteous judge, God the Father, on our behalf. But it all comes down to the question of, how do you plead? We've already talked about how we call on Him. We've talked about what it takes to call out to Him, to be right with Him. But are we willing are we willing to call on Jesus? Are we willing to humble ourselves and throw ourselves at the mercy of God? Are we willing to be united with Jesus by admitting our need through obedience? How do you plead? Let's stand and sing.